birthday, but I think Ted's in the middle of counseling right now, isn't he? Yes, so maybe when, uh, maybe at the end of the service, Ted's, will be back. Ted's counseling someone who came in, so anyway, he's not over here, so we're going to do happy birthday, so remind me at the end, so we get him back here, or somebody commandeer him, get him back here when he's, but you can pray for that, uh, not sure, anyway, I know he's in, um, anyway, I'm not sure how many of you got the book. I probably should have asked that question, but hopefully uh, a few of you do, and hopefully you had a chance to, to read the chapter. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Ephesians, a couple of texts to read in Ephesians chapter 2 and then chapter 4. And then tonight we're looking at the topic of apostles among us. It's a rather bold claim, and the following chapter behind it really then ties in with the whole idea then of the, I like the title, The Folly of Fallible Prophets, which is, gets into... Uh, the whole idea that it's okay to prophesy and get it wrong, which is rather an interesting concept in itself, um, but one that is absolutely uh, essential to, to today's modern, uh, quote-unquote, charismatic uh, movement in terms of their claims. But in Ephesians chapter 2, looking down at uh, verse 18, For through him we have both access in, in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So it's a great text in the church and, and what God has done in establishing the church that we have been joined together, members of the household of God, the family of God. Uh, it's an incredible privilege and that that foundation on which the church is established is really the revelation given uh, through the apostles and the prophets. That God has spoken, has given divine revelation uh, by means of the apostles and the prophets and that has been then uh, recorded for us. We have uh, uh, the, the word of God uh, that has been written and uh, that we have a completed canon, meaning there's no further, no further revelation. Uh, but this whole claim to have prophets is a rather bold claim. And in fact, uh, C. Peter Wagner in 2001 made this massively bold claim uh, that we entered into a new apostolic age. It's interesting, in church history, you won't ever find that claim. Uh, a new apostolic age. So since the first apostles pass off the scene, I'm not going to tell you, you're not going to oh, go through history and find a few people that self-appointed themselves as prophets or claimed they were a pro I mean, not a prophet, an apostle. A uh, unique gift, an apostle, okay? Uh, so C. Peter Wagner's uh, declaration in 2001, and uh, he claims that it is a new radical way, a radical change uh, that is as equivalent, as he would call it, uh, to the Protestant Reformation, or actually he goes on to say that it's even more, uh, more radical in change, that there is now a new apostolic age, which if there is a new apostolic age, what would that mean? If we had new apostles, if he's an apostle and other people, it's also interesting if you continue, if you read the chapter, I don't know how many have, but you, you, the, this new organization that he started, you can actually send in money and join. So for only $69 a month, you too can be an, uh, you too can be an apostle. All right, so, and then they got tiers of apostles, so you got revelatory horizontal and vertical apostles. I mean, all kinds of categories you don't find in the Bible, but, you know, I thought about sending my, my membership card so then I could say, oh, I'm an apostle, so, but no, I wouldn't do that. But, it's, I mean, if, if somebody was an apostle today, what would that mean? They're giving authoritative revelation, right? Authoritative revelation from God. So if C. Peter Wagner is an apostle as he claims he is, then he would be given revelation for all churches that claim the name of Christ, Right? What he says would go. I mean, he would be an apostle of Christ, right? And so that would be giving with revelatory authority. And he, he, he gives this claim. I mean, he made this really, I mean, he gave, if you read it, if you read the story, it's rather just such a moving story. I almost had a tear in my eye to read his testimony about how he, uh, how he figured out that he was an apostle. And then he came to his conclusion, you know, how he declared that this is proof of his appointment. Somebody read it. What he claimed was proof of his appointment to be an apostle. He ended mad cow disease specifically in Europe. So he claimed. That was in uh, you know, 2001. Uh, unfortunately for him, since 2009, there's been 69 cases of mad cow disease reported in Europe alone. Since 2009. In 2001, he claimed to have ended mad cow disease in Europe and said that was proof 
of his apostolic appointment. So the fact that it didn't end means that he's not what? He's not an apostle, but he has he turned in his card? Not a chance. He's running, he runs, you know, he started this movement that's uh, going around anointing people as apostles and telling people that uh, they, uh, they are the true apostles. In fact, he claims, and here comes the, the common claim, the common claim in all movements to be veracity to their claim. Uh, how, do they, how does he back it up? What does he say is proof that this new apostolic age is here and he is an apostle? Because I'm, I'm sorry? Absolutely. He says, hey, we're the fastest growing segment of Christianity. I mean, I've gone down, I mean, when we were going down to, to, uh, to, to, on the streets of Clearwater and Scientology, uh, I cannot tell you how many different uh, leaders the Scientologists paraded out there to come and try and convince us we shouldn't be there, trying to share the gospel with them. But inevitably, the, the, the security guard or one of their, their propaganda leaders would come and tell me, we're the fastest growing religion in the world. And I would say... So? I mean, so that proves what? What does it prove? I mean, so, I mean, th this argument is age old. I mean, when Saddleback Rick, Rick Warren, of Saddle, anyways, Rick Warren was purpose-driven everything, which made him a multimillionaire, you know, so he's very gracious now. He doesn't take a salary from the church. He just keeps selling his books, but yeah, that's a whole other story. But anyway, Rick Warren, if you read his books, he'll tell you again and again that the proof that God is blessing is growth. So you can't argue. We're growing, we're growing, we're growing. It's proof that we are growing. So see Peter Wagner, same old age-long age long argument that if we have growth, that is proof of God's blessing. And then he goes on to say that those who stand against them are... Pharisees, name-calling is always a good, good way it works really well. So just name-call those who would say and expose, the art, expose you for false. And he goes so far as to say that they're actually demonic. I mean, for you to stand against the movement, he would say you're demonic. And that, uh, that kind of name-calling thing has really got a lot of people to back down. Because you don't hear a lot of exposure going on. I, I, I commend MacArthur for taking a stand and publishing a book like this. It has not made him popular. I mean, that hasn't, not with the greater evangelical world, because there's so much defense and so much just trying to play nice, so to speak. Let's get in the same sandbox and play nice. But you really can't play nice with false doctrine, folks. You can't do it. You can't do it. So, but there's too much of that. I, and they use, as I mentioned, ad hominem argument is basically, you know, it's just attack the character without the facts. Just go after character without facts, and, and that, 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 bolsters pointing point your point, um, but it really doesn't. It's a poor way of argumentation. Um, but Wagner uh, claims, or, or should I say, the, the, the reality that the claim should be rejected, and MacArthur goes on to say that it really is at the height uh, of prideful presumption, uh, is because it, it really is, I mean, it, it, he'll get to his own argument, in fact, in, in, this, in this book where he argues for what, what uh, how he can claim to be uh, this, uh, to th this position, and it's, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but it's going to come down to him's going to say, he's just going to say, well, it's my opinion that, you know, this is the argument about apostleship, and I'm an apostle, and you can't argue against me, because in my opinion, these don't stand up, which, you know, so the final authority for C. Peter Wagner is his own opinion. Anybody, I mean, reality, to, to claim that and to claim that position, because now you're claiming authority, right? It's claiming authority that few have ever claimed. In fact, even as uh, in the book documents, uh, he really is, uh, I mean, the Protestant Reformation, because he's trying to tie it together, that this, this new apostolic movement is as significant as Protestant Reformation. The problem with that is, I mean, the Protestant Reformation stood exactly against what he's doing. The Protestant Reformation was a revolt against... Roman Catholic authority, right? And in part of Roman Catholic authority, because when you get into religious debates, because this is one of those things, just argument-wise, uh, people will often say, well, you know, you're Baptist and you believe this, or I'm this and I believe that. Well, it comes back to the basis of authority. Well, what is your base of authority for what you believe? If your base of authority is your experience, you're barking up the wrong tree. Okay? Completely wrong argumentation. That's basically charismatic argument. I had this experience, you can't tell me what it means. 
Well, I just say you may have had an experience, but you can't tell me what your experience means either, apart from an authoritative source. And so it comes back to the argument of authority. In the, in the Pro Protestant Reformation, uh, was a pushback against Rome because Rome claimed that the authority rested with who? With the church, specifically the pope and the cardinals, etc. In fact, the pope is said to speak ex cathedra, meaning he speaks for what? He speaks for Christ. He's the vicar of Christ. And he gives divine revelation, so papal authority, so he can sit and issue a papal bull. It is authoritative to all of the Catholic Church. And the, and the Protestant Reformation, remember one of the cries of the Protestant Reformation, is sola scriptura, the word alone. That the authority is the word, the authority is not the church. And in, Catholic, or in a Catholic view, and this is still true today, in Roman Catholicism, the church is above the Bible. Okay? And the church is over the Bible. In fact, the most average in Roman Catholic scenario, the, the, you, as a, if you're just a member of the Catholic Church, aren't necessarily encouraged to read the Bible yourself. Because after all, you necessarily rightly interpret it, so you need the priest to intercede for you, and the priest's going to tell you what it means. Uh, and, and, but the authority rests with the church, and specifically on up to papal authority, and then handed down. Uh, and honestly, that's... It's what Mormonism does too today. They just kind of followed that, that kind of structure. So the authority in Mormonism is a lot like Roman Catholic authority. That's kind of an aside. But uh, you know, what we would say is, I mean, you know, when C. Peter Wagner says, and, and he claims to be evangelical, believe the gospel, but believe in all these gifts, when he says we have a new apostolic age, he is claiming to speak for Christ. Right? And he's saying this is the significance of the Protestant Reformation. They say, well, wait a minute. The Protestant Reformation was actually a rebuttal of the very thing you're claiming. You're claiming to speak for Christ. And the Protestant Reformation was saying, wait a minute. The church is putting itself over the revelation of God. And if you're claiming to have new revelation of God that is now authoritative of the church, you're now claiming something authoritative outside of the word. The Protestant Reformation was a pushback against that, saying, wait a minute, the real authority rests in the Word of God. And so, the, the, in the, the charismatic movement, leaves really no, or should I say, maybe the way I put the question, the doctrine of Reformation, what doctrine of Reformation leaves no room for the modern charismatic movement, and that doctrine would be sola scriptura, that, that, that the Word is authority. Therefore, those who would claim to have something coming outside of the word serving as authority, really, there's no room for that. We have no room, I mean, because if you have a new word given that's now authoritative for the church, then what do you do with your Bible, right? The Bible now is no longer sufficient, right? I mean, we believe we have a sufficient Bible. I hope we do believe that, right? The Bible is authoritative for faith and practice. We have an all-sufficient word from God that addresses everything we need. And so we come to the scriptures to look for, for, for God's revelation, God's answer, God's direct, the principles, the precepts, how we apply, live a life pleasing to God. And we don't need anything outside of this to direct us. I mean, we need the Spirit of God to, to illumine our minds to the word, but we don't need a new word. And so those who would claim to have a new word really are diminishing the word that we have. Um, then I'll begin at page 92, he really lays out the necessary qualifications for apostle, just really trying to show the point that anybody would claim today to be an apostle of Jesus Christ is making a fault, faulty claim because they can't meet the physical, they can't meet the demands. I mean, the demands are, are very clear. An apostle had to be a physical eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. So, and it wouldn't count for you to say, I had a dream. I saw a 90-foot Jesus in my dream. I had a vision. See, I saw Jesus. Uh, that really doesn't cut it. You need to be in the presence of the resurrected Christ. And so there's a, a, the physical eyewitness of the resurrected Christ, and, and to then be personally appointed, commissioned directly by Christ, and then, then would be an authenticating miracle to authenticate that apostleship through a miraculous sign. That's part of the point of the sign gifts. It's one of the reasons why we're cessationists. Cessationists means we believe the gifts, the miraculous gifts have ceased. That they were a sign that God was giving forth new revelation. And they were part of that, that age, the, the, the birth of the church. The apostles were a gift to the church. That new revelation, which was the foundation. No one can, you know, once a building's foundation is laid, it's laid. Okay? 
So the foundation of the church was through that revelation given through the New Testament prophets and the apostles, and, and that revelation then is upon which we build. The church is being built. The cornerstone is Christ. Everything holds together in Christ. And then we are being built upon that foundation through the teaching and preaching ministry. Uh, uh, in fact, Ephesians 4 talks about that, that the, uh, the gifts of apostleship and, uh, and pastors, teachers, that are for the building up of the saints, all right? And so that is what's taking place uh, now. But the, the, the are, there's no way that anybody today can meet the demands. In fact, it's interesting uh, Wayne Grudem, who is basically the most, uh, uh, the most qualified or the most eminent of, uh, of scholars that have uh, written theologically that actually himself would defend a charismatic position, uh, acknowledges that there are no modern-day apostles, that no one can meet the biblical qualification. Uh, so he acknowledges that very clearly, uh, that there are no, uh, no, no one can meet that, uh, that, that position that's set forth in the scripture. So... Then on page, and I'll just read his quote, this is Wagner's quote, he said, There are, are three biblical characteristics of apostle which some include in their definition of apostle, but which I have chosen not to include. Signs and wonders, that is an authenticating miracle, seeing Jesus personally, that would be specifically the resurrected Christ, uh, planting churches, which I don't think, anyway. He goes, my reasons that I do this is I do not understand these three qualifications to be non-negotiable. Uh, if I've given individual, uh, if a given individual lacks anointing for one or more of them, it is, in my opinion, it would not exclude that individual from a legitimate apostleship. I mean, so I, I mean, church planning. I never, no one, I've, I've never heard anyone argue that that was a sign of being an apostle. But he throws that in the list. Nonetheless, you notice he says you you wouldn't have to have even he he, he suggests there's three, but he said you could be missing one or two of them. Interesting. So that means any church planner out there could claim himself to be an apostle, apparently, right? Because you could be missing the first two. You couldn't be able to do signs and wonders, and you could not, not have seen the per personally seen Christ. But as long as you just met, you, you got one of them, so apparently a church planner maybe could be an apostle, according to his argumentation. But you love his authority, right? In my opinion, uh, that would be the case. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm just going to pick up reading verse 3. He said, For I delivered to you as of first importance that I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Note the wording, verse 8. Last of all, as the one untimely bore born, he appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles and worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. Uh, and then whether it was I or they, we preach, and so you believed. And you see that the key phrase, verse 8, last of all, last of all, Paul says, Christ appeared to me. Physical appearing of the resurrected Christ. Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me. And so the force there, I mean, if Paul, Paul really is the last true apostle. In fact, throughout the, I mean, it, it, another interesting observation, I've taught through uh, the pastoral epistles several times in, in China, and, uh, and you know one of the things you don't see in the pastoral epistles? Apostles. You know, when they went around, after they go back, after churches were planted, we find Paul and his entourage going back through the churches and doing what? Appointing elders, pastors. And so leading the church to be led. I mean, if there was a gift of apostleship and it's been active, and they argue, the Charismatics are really forced to argue this. They argue that there always has been the gift of an apostle given to the church, but we just have kind of failed to recognize it, and there hasn't been enough momentum. Uh, but now there is, and, and it's light of what's happened in the early 1900s, getting traction on this whole charismatic movement and this new infatuation with experience and all these, quote, signs and wonders taking place. So now that all this is happening, we have a new apostolic age in their argumentation. 
And Paul would say that I was the last of the apostles. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they do. I mean, yeah, they're, they're going to make, well, it's, that was just last in order, yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's the series of argumentation. I mean, everything from what, what was the foundation of the church being laid to the fact that these gifts being given. And, I, mean, there's, there's, I mean, it's a series of arguments, obviously that he goes through everything from the cessation of gifts to non-cessation, which there's a ton of arguments given there, which tie to the purpose of them, and what were they actually for, and there's going to be an argument there both ways as to what were they really for. But I would come back to, to, I mean, bottom line is, is what, you know, what does the Bible, act, what does it say, then what do we see worked out? In, you, as we walk through the epistles, where do we find the ongoing ministry of apostleship? You, you know, that where, where do we find that? And that they're going to argue that we now have this new apostolic age, which also is going to argue for all new revelation being given by them, which then is going to get into the, you know, then you're going to take that next series of argument, okay, if you're apostle and you're speaking revelatory, which they claim to do, then your revelation you give must be inerrant. It's not. I mean, which, you know, just like for him to claim I'm an apostle, the proof of it is mad cow disease, I healed it. Well, if you had miraculous power, you know, when, when the apostles healed, those people were healed. Well, I, I, think, I think that they're, they're going to they're gonna try and circular that, that argument. I mean, I haven't read them... I, I mean, I haven't read their argument to say that last doesn't mean last, it just means last in an order. I would agree with you that's probably how they would turn it, okay, because they're going to have to take that text and deal with it. Uh, and they're going to present that as, a, as a, a possible interpretation, which I couldn't argue it isn't possible. I would just say if that's what Paul simply meant, that he was just last in the series and there others would follow, then, then, then would not there have been an apostle appointed? Would we not have had an apostle after Paul? You know, do we not, we, do, we don't see anything about that anywhere in the scriptures. So it seems that Paul, while you could argue these last in the series, last in the order, uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, if that's really what Paul was saying, then where is our next apostle? We're really saying 2001 is now our next, because no church father, read, you can read through the church fathers, no church father thought they were an apostle. All of them agreed that the, the apostolic gifts ended with the close of the canon, with the completion of the clan, canon, and when the apostles died and passed off the scene, there were no more apostles. So I would just say, while that is a possible interpretation of that text, I could not accept it in light of the evidence. Man, so it's a good question. Dr. Comp, do you got something to add to that? Right. 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 And then the whole, even the verbiage, born out of time. One born out of time. He was, he was one born out of time. And what is Paul meaning? He had an unusual appointment. Because the resurrected Christ, who had already ascended, now appears to him. And so he is one born untimely, unlike any of the other apostles. And then thus, and last of, of all. So I, I think... You know, so then, then, I mean, you could go to the other arguments, but the evidence is, would be obviously very secondary to what the text actually says. But I think the evidence stacks up to the text. So that's what I would say. 
All right, the highest, uh, there's a quote on page 95 from, in the book that is just simply, the highest possible position of authority in the church uh, is that of the apostle. It's a unique office encompassing a non-transferable commission from Christ to proclaim revelatory doctrine, uh, which was for the laying of the foundation of the church. So I just put that quote in there because it really is the apostleship was a very unique gift to the church uh, and set forth the, uh, the, the very foundation of the local church. And uh, for anybody to claim that that gift, that position, uh, is an enormous claim. All right. it's, not, it's not little. It's not just a little title. I'm just not arguing about little titles and terms. When somebody starts claiming to be an apostle, you have to understand the magnitude of that claim. Because at that point in time, they are claiming to have authority over the church. Because the apostles did, didn't they? I mean, they were, they, I mean, you know, they, they were carrying out an authoritative position, giving forth divine revelation from God, and that authority wasn't inherently them. It was the fact they were giving forth authoritative word. Absolutely authoritative. You know, without question, authoritative word. Um, so the gifts of apostleship, if they were active to gay, I already mentioned this, it would ultimately mean then uh, that the, we have an incomplete revelation, an insufficient revelation. And then, as we'll even get into in the next chapter, you, the next chapter gets into all the, the prophetic words being spoken that they... they and they make light of the fact that they get it wrong more than they get it right. That's pretty amazing, but uh, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next chapter. Uh, that what, what ultimately constitutes the only true apostolic authority for the church today? Let me read the chapter. What, 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 is, what really is the apostolic authority for the church today? The, the, the New Testament, the writings of the apostles, right? We have, like the early church, remember when the early church, they were, the people were baptized and they joined together under the apostles' doctrine. It's what they were united under, right? The authority of revela revelation given through the apostles was the truth. Uh, in fact, that revelation is so authoritative, Paul would say, if anybody spoke differently than that, right? If I or myself, myself, even an angel from heaven, is to give you another gospel, let him be anathema, let him cursed of God. Because there has been a, a, a authoritative revelation of that gospel given and trusted to the church through the word of God. And there, there is no one uh, who, who's speaking in contradiction should be accepted. Uh, if, if, and there's another quote here on page 98 uh, of the book. If the, uni the unanimous perspective of the church fathers, it was, I sh should not if, it was the unanimous perspective of the church fathers uh, that the ap apostolic age was unique, unre unrepeated, and limited to the first century. And he goes through, and, and it's a, uh, it, it's good, I mean, if you didn't have chance, if you don't have the book, it's worth reading. It gives a great history there uh, of the early church and dealing with the church fathers and giving you a lot of good references back to them and their writings, their understanding. Um, and, uh, and then he's even again quotes back from Wayne Grudem, who does defend uh, miraculous gifts for today, but does not defend apostleship uh, as people being apostles or being able to add to the word of God. So Grudem's the one who was the brainchild behind fallible prophets. We'll, we'll see that next time. Because if you... You know, if you're saying there's no new revelation to add to the Word of God, but that you say there can be prophets today, then you're saying they're speaking prophetically, but maybe not really. You know, it's, it's one of those weird, weird categories. But if you think, you know, anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But, it, I mean, it just really creates this, this whole thing. The tension point is those, those who stand up and say, well, I'm speaking for God. God gave me a word. Now I'm going to tell you, God gave me a word, and I want you, and Richard loves this one, don't eat vegetables anymore. Right? God told me, stop eating vegetables. Richard says, amen, good. I got authoritative word from God. Don't eat vegetables anymore. The problem is, is that really what God has said? And then later I say, well, I got that wrong. <laughs> Sorry, messed up. I mean, this is the kind of, I mean, that, that would be very innocuous, uh, you know, not very damaging, maybe. And some of you may really love vegetables, and I'd wreck your life if I told you don't eat them anymore. Um, not that I have that authority, but <laughs> if you had that, you're saying you're speaking for God, uh, then you're, you're saying you have revelatory authority. Then later, you come back and say, oops, I got that one wrong. Well, at what point is anything believable? Right? 
I mean, at what point? I mean, and, and, uh, and, and it just shifts. It shifts the authority away from uh, the word of God that we have to, to, a, to a leader, and then that leader, then it shifts it around from them back to, you know, to, well, you just kind of pick and choose, because after all, you're not sure they're getting it right anyway. So authority just gets rested back in the individual. So your authority for your own religious experience comes, in, I mean, your, rel your relationship with God comes back to your experience. So whatever makes me feel closer to God, that's it. You know, whatever, so we end up right back to where we basically are as a culture, right? If it's true for me and works for me, don't tell me it's wrong. I mean, yeah, that's, I, I've talked to the, the, the Scientologists again, they're right there. You go down and you talk to them, and they'll just tell you, well, you know, they'll tell you, you can be any religion, whatever you are, you can Baptist. In fact, they paraded out a Baptist, one person was formerly a Baptist deacon once, and somebody they told me was in seminary. And that person did know a lot about the Bible, seemingly. I mean, they could quote a lot of verses, but they wanted to say, you could be any of this in a Scientologist, true, too. And I always said, wait a minute, time out. And so let's talk about that, because what you say Scientology teaches and what the Bible teaches are inherently different. I mean, they can't both be true, all right? So when we come into the charismatic world and you have people saying, hey, I'm speaking for God, and we have appointed leaders or apostles who speak for God, and, you have the Bi and we have the revelation of God, uh, and what's being spoken doesn't matter, I mean... Both can't be true, folks. It's just you, you can't have the smorgasbord truth or the individual truth set or it's whatever works for me. That just, that, you know, it's not. Truth is not, um, is not a subjective to your personal experience, okay? Truth is authoritatively delivered and must be received. And ultimately, even as, I mean, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it takes a spiritual mind to perceive spiritual truth, which means we all desperately need a work of the Spirit in order to really understand. And apart from that, we're going to be clueless, all right, and wide open to, to deception. Back in Ephesians, we were back, going back to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, that's, there's another text, and this would be, uh, in Ephesians, where he's already said in chapter 2 that you've got the foundation laid by the apostles. Uh, then in chapter 4, where he talks about the gifts given to the church, uh, this is, again, this would be the other text. As far as New Testament epistles, it mentioned the word prophet. Here comes the other passage, I mean apostles, sorry. Um, beginning in Ephesians 4, and verse 11, which this is the gifts. And he gave, speaking of Christ, Christ gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ so we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes rather, schemes, rather speaking the truth in love we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head Christ uh, so here, this section, obviously God is given gift. He's given gifted men. He's given includes apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And that equipping of the saints is the work of the ministry, which then is then redefined in terms of which will result in the building up of the body of Christ. Okay, then the key phrase, until we all attain to the unity of faith. And the charismatics would want to say that, see, he's given apostles until we all attain to the unity of faith. So therefore, apostles are given until that happens, and that speaks to the coming of Christ again. So that's the second coming. We won't actually be there until then. Therefore, the apostolic gift is there. Uh, it really brings a false modification. I mean, it, it's jumping over a whole lot of text to make that until be a part of the when he gave gifts. The gifts is given what the purpose of the gifts are. This is going to take place until this happens. But the giving of the gifts is not until this happens. Do you understand the difference? The gifts are these gifted people. What were they given for? You look at the text. And he gave these gifts for this purpose, to equip the saints to do the work of the, to do the, work of the ministry. That's the purpose of the gifts. And then the, the, the saints doing the work of the ministry are to build up the body of Christ until what happens? Until we reach a unity of faith. 
All right? So the body is to be built up in the knowledge of the Son of Man, become mature, becoming Christ-like, that we may longer be children tossed to and fro. And I would never take that as that will not happen until Christ comes again, either. I mean, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, here's the gifted men given to the church. This is the purpose why they've been given. And this, as we are matured in faith, will build one another up. The result of that will be we'll come to maturity. More Christ-likeness, increasing Christ-likeness, which results in not being tossed about and deceived. Okay? And I don't think that, I mean, ultimately that will end. There will be no more deception and will be perfectly mature when Christ comes. There's no doubt about that. But he is not saying in this text that the gift of apostles and prophets are going to continue until Christ comes. That's not what he's saying. It's just, it's, again, it's let me mix the wording and try to promote a position rather than let the words actually say what they mean. Okay? So I can cherry pick any text. You know what I'm saying? I can cherry pick a text, tie things together. And in fact, Richard pitched a great, maybe I should have him do it again. He preached a great message several years ago. I asked him to do it. Basically, why God hates vegetables. And he took a series of biblical texts, he cherry-picked them all over the Bible, and he was arguing that God hates vegetables. Okay, now, there, and, and some of you were here when he did that, because some of you were getting pretty upset with him. This is at a Berean service, actually, because it's like, you can't say that. And, and it's like, but he was cherry-picking the Bible so much, that it's like, well, maybe he's got a point here. No, he didn't have a point. The point was, if I cherry pick and I don't get, don't get if, I, if I'm not subject to the authority of the scriptures, I can pour it on top of the scriptures and convince you of almost anything. I mean, because why, why are there so many different false religions in the world? Why? Because people want to cherry pick, all right? In other words, I want to take my conclusion and come to here, and then I'm going to drive it home. And if you do that, you can kind of cherry pick the scriptures and try and foster a position. But that's why one of the interpretive principles that we hold to very dearly is that context is king. We, we hold to a literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of scripture. So it has to be rightly interpreted in its context. And the wording and the word structure is very important. And so we let the text speak for itself rather than try and pour it on top of the text. And, and when you're just trying to advocate a position, then you stop. You stop. You stop that. In fact, the, the, there's a quote then, Ephesians chapter 4 demonstrates the purpose for which the Lord gave apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers to equip the saints. And so apostolic secession is a devastating truth to a continuous position, to those who would hold to the position of continuation. Continuation is just saying that all these gifts continue. Um, because even as Grudem would acknowledge that the, the, that, that, uh, apost the, the gift of apostles does not continue. Well, if one gift doesn't continue, why would you say the others do? Okay? And it's just part of that, the, the, the evidence of the fact that uh, they argue, again, for, an, you know, for the ongoing work of the Spirit in all of these categories, tongues, uh, prophetic word, and then we'll get into the next week into the, all the prophecies that they're, they're speaking and they're saying and all the ways that they... Uh, they've been clearly documented. I mean, we've got enough church history now, over 100 years of church history with, with charismatic movement. And it is, it is, folks, it is the largest movement in the world today. 500 million. Okay? For those that claim to be evangelical, the charismatic movement is the largest movement in the world. So when they claim that their proof is in the numbers, they have the numbers. Okay? They have the numbers. Now the question is, is do numbers prove something's a work of God? Because if you're going to say yes, then you should go become a charismatic. <laughs> if you're not, then you better stand fast on what the word has to say and trust God on that other side of the equation. And in the exposure of this false doctrine, uh, which is, is, like I said, it is in the day we live, exposing false doctrine is not, not, a, pop, not a popular position. It is one looked down on and despised, greatly despised. Thomas Edwards said this, the fact that the gift of the apostles ceased with the apostolic age is a devastating blow to the basic assumption and the underlying, underlying the entire charismatic perspective, namely the assumptions that all gifts are to be operative throughout the church age. We know at least one gift ceased, therefore their foundational assumption is incorrect. And that's just, just his whole point. There's, their, their foundational assumption made is that these gifts continue uh, throughout the church age until the return of Christ. And this gift 
without doubt is not continued, which just shows a hole in the whole basic argument of their position. All right, anything else from this chapter that you read, that you observed, that you'd like to make comment to or ask a question about? I'd encourage you to get the book and read it. If you haven't got it, we have some more over in the office. I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, and even as uh, several have already done, there are people that you know who are being influenced or are in this kind of movement. Pass it on. Ask them to read it with you. And you, re you sit down and talk with them. And just tell them, you're not, out, you're not trying to get a fight. Your point is, let's go back to the authoritative source, which is the Word. What does God's Word really say about this matter? Because the shift, it's just, it seems it's sometimes subtle and people can be so excited about God and, uh, and God talk. Um, but are you excited about the God of the Bible or are you excited about the God of your experience? Are you, you know, as Dr. McCune, I, uh, my systematic theology professor always said, we, we're all born with a make our own God kit. Come into this world ready to make and worship our own God. And there are lots of people who are ready to help you craft it and let you worship it and call it Jesus. Just because somebody calls it Jesus doesn't make it Jesus. Okay? So you and I don't get the right to define truth. We've been given authoritative truth, which is to be studied, and that's what even as we'll, well, we'll get there in a few weeks, but in 2 Timothy, to study show ourselves approved, right? Workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for